Good evening and welcome to Between the Lines. I'm John Mattison. The debate about decolonizing education has been raising a lot of heat in South Africa in the last few years on both sides of the arguments. Um, tonight we have a guest who's been working for 20 years to add some light to the subject, particularly to the decolonizing of history. Um, my guest is Carl Russell uh, from Germany. He's a journalist. Welcome and thank you for coming. Thank you very much for inviting me. You're here to uh, launch an exhibition at the castle in Cape Town, which is running from now until June, uh, and which has been performing in, uh, uh, you, you've, you've exhibited in, in Germany quite a bit. Uh, tell us a little bit about it. The exhibition is running in Germany and Switzerland for already six or seven years. It has been in 60 different locations, but we are very happy that now for the first time we can go with the results of our research to one of the countries where we started our research in the 1990s. You, you, you have researched in South Africa and other parts of the continent. Um, one of the th quotes that fascinated me from your presentation is from a, uh, uh, a researcher in uh, Burkina Faso who said that World War II was for Africa the most devastating event since the slave trade. Can you explain? Yeah. This historian is Joseph Kiselbo. He's the first one who wrote a history of Africa from an African perspective. And he just uh, numbers, for example, the soldiers from Africa who fought in World War II. So there were one, one million soldiers under British command, one million soldiers under French command. There were These are Africans. Africans, Africans. And then from African colonies, from the British and French colonies. There were 700... 50,000 partisans and soldiers in Ethiopia fighting the Italians. There were 335,000 from South Africa. And there were hundreds of thousands of Africans who had to do forced labor. It was never as big as during the Second World War to produce all the raw material for the arms industries of all the nations fighting the war. And that's why he comes to the conclusion that was more devastating than anything since the slave trade. Us, of course, there, there are several reasons why World War II is discussed less in South Africa than it should be and less in, in, in South Africa than in other countries, even though South African soldiers, uh, I think you said 330,000 fought in, in World War II, of whom about 120,000 were black. Yes, more than one third were black. Were black. And, uh, of course, the, uh, the government from 1948... Uh, that came to power included many people who had been uh, sympathetic to the Nazi side. So they weren't keen to give expression to South Africa's role in fighting against uh, Nazism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly, because uh, like in many other countries, the history of the participation of colonized people, and especially of black people, was just hidden after the Second World War right. because people didn't want to recognize their contribution to the liberation of Europe. Right. Now, is there a reason that you, as a German, have, to, have chosen to devote so, so much of your life to bringing this to, uh, to, to public awareness? Oh, well, there's a very simple reason. I am German, and Germany is one of the powers who is the most responsible for World War II. And as a journalist who is interested in international issues, whenever I went to another country, I was kind of seeing monuments which were related to our history. If it was in the Philippines, as a cemetery for victims of World War II. If I went to Australia, I saw an exhibition about Aborigines in World War II. When I went to the Pacific, I heard that there are still islands completely uh, destroyed by the fighting of World War II. You find rotten ships on the beaches on the Solomon Islands. In North Africa, almost every family can tell you that their relative, their grandfather, father, grandfather, went to the war, not only in North Africa, but they, they fought in Europe, they fought in Italy, they fought in France. They were the majority of the free French forces. Until f 1944, the majority of the French uh, army who fought Nazism were Africans, were blacks, were North Africans. And de Gaulle just changed that in 1944 when he was sure they would win the war. He sent back the black soldiers to camps in South uh, southern France because he wanted to celebrate his victim with white French soldiers and so already defining the image of this war for the time afterwards. So that he should march down the Champs-Élysées ahead of a, a white French force. There were a couple uh, of blacks in the Champs-Élysées sure. but he didn't want that the big majority would be African. And that was orchestrated? Yes. 
Yeah, there was a was a law of uh, he called it blanchissement de de troupes. That's Wh white, white washing, white white washing of the French army. It's an extraordinary story, isn't it? Um, now, of course, you 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 start by saying. I mean, right at the very beginning, the notion we have that World War II took place from 1939 to 1945, you say that even that is not right because Ethiopia, there was a war uh, against the Italians, Hitler's ally, uh, from 1935. Yes, I mean, if you look on, uh, to World War II from a perspective which is not European, the war in different continents, in all continents, started before it is even mentioned in our history books. The war in Ethiopia uh, started in October 1935 with an invasion of 300,000 soldiers. In our history books, if it is mentioned, they say Italian soldiers. It's not right. Half of the soldiers under Italian command were from Italian colonies, Somalis, uh, Eritreans, uh, and from Libya. 150,000 uh, colonial soldiers on the Italian side. They invaded Ethiopia. Haile Selassie had his own army, 250,000 soldiers who fought the Italian invasion. But they had modern weapons, so after one year, they occupied the capital, Addis Ababa. Already 100,000 civilians were dead in Ethiopia, but then there were 500,000 partisans, so-called patriots, who did a guerrilla fight against the Italians. And the British who fought Italy in Eastern uh, Africa, in Ethiopia, they only came in in 1939. For four years it was the Ethiopians fighting the Italians. And then there came these soldiers from the British colonies and from other continents. We counted it together. You had in Ethiopia fighting soldiers from 17 different countries and four continents. Indians, Australians, Europeans, Africans from different colonies. We asked the question, why is that not called a world war? If soldiers from four continents and 17 nations or colonies fight in one place, because it's not in Europe, because the majority are black, because it's in Africa, what would happen if in France or Italy or Germany there's a war with armies from 17 different countries and different continents? Of course it would be called World War. And in fact, as, as you point out, since they were, uh, it, the one side was allied to Hitler, it was part of what became World War II. I'm afraid we have to take a break. We'll be right back. And we're back with Carl Russo. Um, Carl, uh, the other case you mentioned that was also really going before 1939 was China, where China, I mean, the, the, uh, the rape of Nanking in 1937 uh, by the Japanese, who were, became allies of Hitler, uh, 300,000 killed in 1937. Yes, so there's another example that our uh, dates, our coordinates to talk about World War II are wrong. If you look at other continents, I mean, it was the start of the Japanese war, and it was meant to start in China and then to occupy the rest of South and, uh, Southeast Asia and the Pacific region. And it was one big plan. Why this is not included in World War II, but uh, mentioned as a Japanese-Chinese war, I don't understand, because it was the beginning of the World War in the whole second half of the world. Yeah. Now, uh, I know you didn't uh, personally work on the, on the South African component of this research, but uh, for, South, for South Africa, there were many uh, connections to World War II. Uh, some of the people who then joined the ANC and worked with Mandela and who trained in controversies where had fought in World War II. Uh, um, did you, uh, were there, are, there are, and, and of course, in your, in your other colleagues' research, they found... Uh, black ex-servicemen in South Africa. Yeah, we did interview a colleague of mine, Birgit. She did interview black ex-servicemen, for example, in Soweto. The images are also in our publications. The images are also in the exhibition here at the, in, at the castle because they're, what we very much appreciate is that there is an extra section which gives more detailed information on South Africa, which Dennis Goldberg added to our exhibition. And there you will see some of the portraits also of black uh, veterans of World War II. Uh, the interesting thing is that, like in many of the other colonized countries, also in South Africa, the white uh, commanders didn't want to arm 
black soldier. So they just had to do very uh, basic services like uh, driving trucks uh, or whatever. They didn't want to give them weapon like in many other colonized uh, countries because the colonizers were afraid that they might turn them against uh, the colonizers themselves. And they were better, uh, worse paid. They only got uh, about 40% of the payment of white soldiers. They didn't get any pension. White soldiers, when they came back, they be often became a part of land or they were able to stay in the armed forces of South Africa. Blacks weren't. Blacks were not allowed to stay in the army when they came back from the war. Most, uh, what they got was uh, a bit of money to go back and if they were lucky, they got a bicycle. And uh, they that's actually it. got a bicycle from the government. Yeah, but only when they had a, a job because the bicycle was also meant to make them uh, getting better to their job where they could Productive. work. Now, uh, you also tell a story uh, about a, a case of South Africans in North Africa who were killed. Yeah, there were many South Africans in North Africa. That was one of the uh, places most important for the war in Africa when the German and the Italian troops invaded uh, first Libya and they were on their way to Egypt. And there in the desert, there were a lot of fights. So there were 60,000 South African fighting the German troops in the Libyan desert. And in one occasion, that was in uh, 1941, in November, the 5th Brigade of the Cape Corps was engaged in a costly battle with the Germans. 3,000 South Africans became prisoners of war in German, they had to go to German camps, and 224 were killed. The survivors buried their dead side by side in a mass grave, but the South African High Command had the bodies exhumed shortly afterwards to bury, bury them again, and this time separated according to colors in three different Graves. White colored and African. Yes. Yeah. And so uh, racial segregation, which became law with the apartheid since 1948 uh, in the armed forces of uh, South Africa, existed already existed during before the Second it. World yes. War. Yes. And um, yes, I mean, South Africa has had a lot of um, attention to this tragic case from World War I when the SS Mendy uh, was. Uh, uh, crippled and, and sunk, and over 700 uh, black South African troops uh, d were drowned. Uh, that was in World War I. But these figures and the, this extensive uh, material has really not been good, got the attention it deserves. You found even with historians um, in Europe, they were often, the attention just wasn't there, and some were keen on what you did, but some were resistant. Yes, yeah, some are resistant because they have the cynical attitude to say, who are you journalists who tell us what we didn't uh, uh, realize for 60 years? I mean, but there are others, for example, historians in Switzerland who themselves worked, for example, on the war in Ethiopia, who welcomed our project very much. They invited us to show the exhibition in the Historical Museum in Luzern. They made a whole uh, half a semester at the university under the focus of this issue because they said it's extremely important to put it straight, the half of the history of World War II is missing because the rest of the world is just left out. Uh, because what you've done is really to pull it all together. I mean, there, are, there is good historical work in some of these places, but you've pulled it all together. Yes, uh, we, were, we were astonished when we started this project. We had the feeling there is something missing. And then we started and we traveled to 30 different countries in Africa, Asia, to Australia, to the Pacific. And wherever we went, we found heaps of material. There were local historians who had written about it. There were veterans who had written their biographies. There were veterans clubs where we, when we started in the 1990s, wherever we went, in each uh, big, bigger African city you would find on veterans clubs, you just had to go there and there were a dozen of men who had been in World War II. And they were so welcoming, they were so glad that finally somebody came to listen to their story. And we always felt our work is to collect these voices which are hidden, uh, these uh, stories of heroes, of our liberators who are uh, suppressed and to present them to the public. So we were collectors and translators and 
we basically try to work with historians also from these very countries. Well, some of that work is being done now, too, in South Africa, but obviously a great deal more is needed. Yes, I, mean, I think it's just a tiny start. It's a push, we hope, into changing the perspective in looking at history, especially at history of World War II, but it also has a lot of consequences for the present day, for contemporary politics, if you look into this history, because you should take consequences from it. Once you recognize all these millions of millions of people in all continents, Africa, Asia, Latin America, who have fought for liberating the world from fascism, one would have to treat these people and countries differently than it is done today. When you see that... We're, we'll ta we'll take a break. I know where you're going with this. <laughs> we'll follow up and look at the European refuse, refugee situation when we come back. And we're back with Carl Russell. Uh, before we get on to the European refugees, there are a couple of other things I wanted to ask you about. Um, the one is the, uh, the, the, the range of, of uh, victims outside of Europe. You were saying uh, during the break that in Ch China there were more victims than Europe combined. Yeah, in China there were more than 20 million victims, and that is more than in all the three countries who were responsible for World War II, Germany, Japan, and Italy all together. So if you count the number of victims, also the statistics of the casualties would have to be changed. The problem is that the figures often are not there because many of the colonized people who died in World War II were not just counted. They were not even counted because they were colonized people. All their casualties were put under the casualties of the colonial power, as French, British, German, whatever, Italian, you name it. So it is very difficult. We try to find estimates by local historians, be it in Papua New Guinea, be it in Morocco, be it in Kenya, what they say, how many people died. And if you, we don't give a complete number because there are two vague these figures, but there, there are millions and millions of people who died in World War II who are not mentioned in any history book, in any statistic of the casualties up to this very day. And in your research and the research of your colleagues, you found that there was a real hunger in these communities in Africa and elsewhere for the recognition they'd been denied. Yes, people asked us to, to present these facts to the countries responsible for the war. People were still hoping that there could be maybe some kind of recognition or compensation. Or if you go to Asia, for example, there were 200 to 300,000 women who were abducted and abused and raped in Japanese military brothels. They were kept in cages like dogs and they were raped up to 40 times per day. And up to this very day, none of these women has ever had an official uh, recognition or an official compensation by the Japanese government. One woman you can hear, we have this listening station in our exhibition from South Korea, she, she says the Japanese government is just waiting that we all die. They did a few treaties with governments, like with the South Korean military government years ago, and then they said the things are settled. But the victims themselves, they are left out. As in Africa, the victims of the Africa Corps of Rommel in North Africa, well, they used forced labor. We don't find anything in German history books about that. Who did compensate them? In the Libyan desert, there are thousands of landmines by the Germans and Italian fascists. There was an Al Jazeera documentary saying that there were 900 uh, casualties in recent years because of landmines by the Germans. They didn't even clean the place afterwards. That's so 50, 60, 70 years later. Yes, and you had minimum 60,000 Africans who were in German prisoner camps for German uh, prisoners of war. They had to do forced labor. And with the collaborating government of Vichy, the French fascist government, they even collected money in West African countries to feed their compatriots, the prisoners in German camps. In the Ivory Coast, there were a committee which collected uh, food, money, blankets, to be sent through the French to German prisoner camps for the African prisoners. And none, I wouldn't know of any of these African prisoners who has ever get any compensation by Germany. 
And in many places, they just killed the African prisoners on the spot. When the German army invaded northern France in 1940, there were 10,000 of prisoners, colonial soldiers in German control. And after they had already surrendered, given up their arms, on many places the Germans selected the soldiers by color. French white soldiers to the left, black soldiers to the right, and then they massacred them on the spot with machine guns and run over with tanks. Minimum 3,000, probably 5,000 were killed like that. That was in southern France? That was in, southern, in, in northern, France, northern France, when the Germany occupied the north of France. Yeah. And the cynical thing is that the families of these victims, so you have huge cemeteries in France now with African graves from this time, but the families don't even get a visa to visit their ancestors on these European cemeteries because of this fortress Europe policy of recent years. Yeah. Now, your, your, your uh, research has been courageous in looking at all sides of this, and that includes collaborators. There were, there were um, Africans, Arabs, others in, in, in third world countries who were on the side of, of uh, the, the Nazi, the Nazi uh, war machine. Yes. I have to say that in all continents, definitely more people were fighting fascism than were on the side of Germany, Italy, or Japan. But it's right. part of history to be correct to not forget that the fascists always had sympathizers wherever yes. they went. In North Africa, for example, the fascist uh, powers had more than 100 camps for political prisoners and Jews from North Africa. 5,000 Jews were killed in these camps. But the, the, the people guarding these camps and the people torturing these prisoners were Arabs, were North Africans. You had leading politicians from India, from Palestine, from Iraq, who were in the capital city of Germany during the Second World War, from 41 to 45. And they were closely working together with the Nazis for their propaganda machine, for their international radio, and they recruited tens of thousands Arabs and Indians for the German army and for the Waffen-SS. One of the most uh, famous war criminals of these years is a former Palestinian leader, Husseini, who was a close friend of, he went to visit Hitler and he, he recruited 200,000 Muslims for the German army to fight in the Soviet Union. And he asked every Arab country to follow the German way of the final solution and kill all Jews they could find in all Arab countries through the German radio. We're just about out of time, so I do want to go back to the issue of refugees. Uh, you, you ob you're obviously making the link that since so many uh, Africans, for example, and, and uh, Arabs, who, who are now refugees coming to Europe, uh, their antecedents fought against uh, Hitler in World War II, and yet now, not only, as you said, can they not visit the graves of their ancestors, but when they're refugees in desperate need, they're being kept out of Europe. Yes, I think in Europe we are seeing a very, very uh, bad policy of closing all borders and building these fortresses of Europe. The consequence is that in last year alone, more than 4,000 people drowned in the Mediterranean seas with these small boats they're trying to cross, and half of them are Africans. In the last decade, on the borders of Europe, 25,000 people died. Who is talking about this? The Mediterranean Sea is now the biggest mass grave in the world, and the majority of the victims are Africans. I'm afraid we have to end there. Carl, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. For uh, and for, for doing all this work over all these years and for coming to Cape Town to show it to us. I s heartily recommend you go to the castle. It's an extraordinary sight to see the mixture of, sort of colonial era, era things and this remarkable exhibition. It's open till June. Please do go and see it. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, good night, and I hope you go and see it.